thank you again. Doesn't she look nice tonight? I mean, she looks like a movie star. Look at this. Stand, you, stand, look at this. She got sequins on. If Kim had those on, she wouldn't know what to act like. I mean, she thinks she's a country and western star, right? Yeah, she got it. it she, just, <laughs> she, she just got it. It just came right there. Where'd her husband go? Where'd you go? Where'd he go? Oh, there you are. All right. God bless you, brother. I've added you to my list of prayers. That's, uh, <laughs> hallelujah. It's called the death clock. You can go online. You can put your age, put your gender, put, actually put your birth date in. Put your birth date in. Put your gender. They ask you a couple of questions about your health and your outlook and all that kind of stuff. And it'll come up and tell you approximately how many days you have to live. It's called the death clock. So I did it this morning. Based on the death clock, 9 a.m. this morning, I've got 8,894 days, 1 hour, 53 minutes, and 6 seconds to live. In other words, I'm going to live till I'm 88, 1 month, and 2 days. <laughs> what about that? The Bible tells us to number our days that we may present to Him a heart of wisdom. What if you knew that you had 100 days to live? What would you do? That's exactly what Eugene O'Kelly learned in May of 2005. He wrote a book about it that I reread recently. It's called Chasing Daylight. I'd, I'd commend it to you. He had three brain tumors that they told him that he had three months to live. He lived 100 days. Eugene O'Kelly was a hard-driven CEO of a company that didn't have time to slow down to do anything particularly with his family or his friends. And here's what he said. He says the news of his imminent death was a gift because it made him think seriously about his own death, which forced him to think more deeply about his own life. He decided to unwind relationships with the significant people in his life to say goodbye and make sure they knew how they had impacted his life. In the course of saying goodbye, he would sometimes invite a friend to take a stroll in the park. This was sometimes not only the final time he would take such a leisurely walk together, but also the first time. And he mourned over it. Mainly, he wanted to make sure he was right with his family and those closest to him. He says at the end of the book, as for those considering taking the time someday to plan their final weeks, months, and days, three words of advice. Move it up. I want to challenge you to do it tonight. To get your life right tonight. Because the truth is, you don't know how long you have to live. Some of us think we're going to live a long time, but however long it is, it's going to be sooner than you can imagine. I say to people, they'll say, it's good to see you, and I say, it's rather to be seen than viewed. But one day that'll happen, quicker than I can imagine. I'll be 67 years old on Monday. I don't know how I got to be 67. I used to think people 67 were ancient, and now I'm not sure what I am. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't really know. Ancient, I don't know. Uh, but, 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 but I was at Linden Baptist Church uh, two years ago in March. And uh, when I think of myself, I think of myself as about 40. But I'm not 40 anymore. But, <laughs> but anyway, I was talking about how old I was. And uh, this was two years ago. So there was a woman in the back of the church that uh, I was telling about back when I, the Lord called me to ministry, uh, uh, I, I, I knew God had called me, and every time the preacher would stand to preach, when I got back in church of Feb in February of 1976, uh, uh, I was asking the Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? And, 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 and he would just point right at me. So I found the woman with the biggest hair. 
Y'all remember the big hair? Well, in this church in Linden, she still had it. <laughs> she, she had a big bouffant gray hair. <laughs> well, in church, I, I found this woman, and, and the preacher pointed right at me and split that hair right down the middle. So I told that story that night. And uh, so after it was over, she came up to me, and, and she said, well, you know, uh, from a distance, I didn't believe you as how old you was till I got up close to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy, that, that, that was kind of deflating, you know what I'm saying? But the truth is we're all getting older, aren't we? Every one of us. Now, you young people think you're going to live forever, but you're not. Facing death will change your life, change my life. My mother in the fall of 1975 found out she had a tumor in her uterus the size of a grapefruit. And they went in to operate on her and come to find out it was benign. But when they took it out, she nearly bled to death. And I remember sitting in Lexington Baptist, in, in, at uh, Baptist Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, and the, the doctor walked in. To, the, actually, it wasn't the doctor. It was the attending nurse walked in and said, Mr. Garland said, uh, uh, we have we've found the tumor and we got it out and we're, we're pretty sure it's benign, but your wife is hemorrhaging severely and we're not sure she's going to live. I was in the midst of addiction to alcohol. And uh, have you got a pen for 42 years, 8 months, and 12 days? We can get you one. I've, I count it every day. I keep track of it. I don't ever want to forget. Because it was that day that I began my journey to sobriety and actually to having my life transformed by Jesus Christ. But I went into a chapel at Baptist Hospital in Lexington. The first time as an adult, really, I'd ever prayed. And I went into that chapel and I got on my knees and I said, God, if you'll spare my mother, I'll give you my life. About an hour later, they came out and said, well, miraculously, the bleeding stopped. And I knew that God had healed my mother. Well, that was in October. That was in, yeah, the 1st of October, right after my birthday. And if you know anything about alcoholics, you, you have to get through the holidays. I don't understand it, why you have to drink during Thanksgiving and Christmas, but you do. And so after the first of the year, I started reading the Bible. And uh, God spoke to me clearly. He said, I've spared your mother. Now, won't you? You see, but it was facing death that brought me life. That's my prayer for you tonight. If I wish, and somehow, I wish somehow you could know the time of your death because it would bring you life. In Acts chapter 4, these two disciples, Peter and John, they were arrested. And turn with me to Acts chapter 4 if you have a Bible. It really began in Acts chapter 3. The story in Acts chapter 3 is Peter and John. You know Peter. Peter's the one who denied Jesus. But when we meet Peter in Acts chapter 2, he's preaching the first sermon and 3,000 people get saved. What happened to Peter was that Peter met the risen Christ. You see, in order to have life, you've got to meet life. And life can only be met in someone who has lived and died and lived again. And that person is Jesus. Well, they'd met the risen Christ, and in Acts chapter 3, there was a man that was born lame. Every day, somebody brought him to the temple gate, and they, one of his family and laid him there, and he would beg for alms. And this day was going to be his last day of begging. This day, he was going to get not what he asked for, but what he needed. And as Peter and John walked by, they said to him, uh, look at us, Acts chapter 3. They said, look at us. Uh, and so the man did. And, 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 and so he turned to them expecting to get something from them. Verse 5 says, but Peter said, I, neither, uh, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Get up and walk. And the truth is the man did. So they took him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up, stood, started to walk, and entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. I'm telling you, that's a beautiful picture of salvation. Oh, man. 
Some of you are too old to jump, but 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 you can leap, you 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 can hop, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right, Buck, right. That's right, brother Brooks. That's all right. I mean, if we got as excited about Jesus, we'd about turkey hunting. We'd change the world, wouldn't we? Hello. This man had never walked. I'm telling you, I was a lame man. I didn't know how to live for six years without dependence on something outside of me that I put inside of me. But Jesus Christ changed my life when he came, when, 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 it, when he came to me through his word and said, I spared your mother now, won't you? And I tell you, I've been leaping and jumping and praising God ever since. My worst day now is better than my best day used to be, right? I lived on the edge of hell and I met some of you there. But I want to tell you tonight, I don't live there anymore. So Peter and John, the man walked, and he ran through Jerusalem telling everybody, Praise God, in the name of Jesus, I'm walking. <laughs> so what happened was the religious people heard about it. They thought they was done with Jesus. And here this man goes running all over Jerusalem telling them that the name of Jesus, he'd been healed. So what did they do? They arrested Peter and John. They arrested them. Look in chapter 4. It says, uh, now, uh, 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 as they were speaking to the people, uh, the priest, this is Peter and John, uh, uh, the, the, the priest, the commander of the temple guard, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were, uh, they were provoked that they were teaching the people, proclaiming the person in the person of, of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. So they seized them and put them in custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So on one day, 3,000 saved, and a couple of days later, 5,000 got saved. But they arrested Peter and John, and they put them in prison. They put them in a dungeon. Now listen. It says, the next day their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. And after they had Peter and John stand before them, they asked them the question, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, here, here's where theologians think they took Peter and John. They put him in the same dungeon that they put Jesus. You know, when they arrested Jesus... They put him in a dungeon in the house under the house of the high priest. Have you been to Jerusalem? You've been? Man, you ought to send your pastor to Jerusalem. Seriously, I'm not kidding. Y- y'all got to send your pastor to Israel. And you need to go. I'm not kidding. You need to shake your head and go, yes, I, I, I need to do this. <laughs> uh, you, I agree with you. I'm telling you, it changes your life. I took a tour. I took 26 people in, in, in 1993, and it absolutely made the Bible come alive. Unbelievable. Went to the dungeon below the house of Caiaphas where they hung Jesus overnight. I actually walked on the very steps up to the, it's one of the authentic places where Jesus actually walked. Walked up the steps to the house of Caiaphas. And you know Jesus put his feet right Peter and John were put in the very same dungeon where they'd put Jesus. And here's what they're thinking. They killed Jesus. They're going to kill us. You see, sometimes the best decisions are made when you have to face your own death. When you have to face your own finality. When you have to admit that you're finite. That this life as we know it is going to end. Sometimes the best decisions are made in a cemetery. Sometimes it's best to go think about things, and that's actually what I do. When I have to make significant decisions, I go to where I'm going to be buried. I already got my tombstone. I didn't know what they was going to say about me, so I put it on there myself. <laughs> no kidding. By His grace, for His glory. I ain't going to put it to, I ain't going to, put it to chance because there's no telling what they have said. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. But the truth is, we got to face death before we can live. we got to face our death, that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. Peter and John were arrested, and, and, and they asked them, 
By what power and what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. (laughs) They told him, basically they told him to shut up. Listen to what goes on down. They didn't know what to do with him. So it says in verse 18, So they called for them and ordered them not to preach or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. (laughs) They couldn't shut them up. I pray God not shut you up. I pray nothing will shut you up. So what would you do if you knew you had a few days to live? Well, I want to give you three things that these people did. One was their faith got stronger. You see, if you knew you was going to die, you get your faith right. Hello, right? So some of you tonight need to get your faith right. I don't want to scare anybody into, into heaven, but I sure want to scare you out of hell. If you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? And I know where I'm going to spend eternity. Do you? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Those who are in Christ are alive in Christ. We've been made alive in Jesus. So what about you, young people? You know where you're going to spend eternity? You see, if you're old enough to know what sin means, you're old enough to be saved. And every one of you are old enough. What about you? What about you in the balcony? What about you moms and dads? What about you gray hairs and no hairs and whatever? I ain't going to go much farther than that. Seriously. Seriously. It's Wednesday night, last night of revival. Now, your pastor is going to preach the gospel Sunday. doesn't mean it's the only night you can get saved. But it's a very simple question. Where are you going to spend eternity? You see, your, your, your children ought to know. Your spouse ought to know. Your friends ought to know. I've done too many funerals. Well, I didn't know. And I didn't preach them into heaven. I've often said, we don't know where he is. We hope he's with Jesus. We hope she's with Jesus. But we shouldn't be sitting there having to worry about it. We ought to be clear about it. Right? Are you clear? And if you're not clear, this can be your night, September the 26th, 2018. If you knew you was going to die, you'd get your faith right. That's what these disciples did. They said salvation is found in no one else. Listen to what it says. Verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. They got their faith right. We pray that will happen for you tonight. What else would you do? You'd take a stand. You'd be a person of conviction. Some of us are so wishy-washy. Someone challenges us about our faith, and we just kind of wilt. I'm telling you, if you knew you was going to die, you wouldn't care what anybody thought. And I don't care. I really don't. I, I, it, I, I want people to know what I stand for. I want people to know that I'm standing up for Jesus because he stood up for me on a cross. You'd take a stand. Become a person of conviction about the name of Jesus. If you were going to die soon, you'd get your faith right with God. Well, you're going to die sooner than you can imagine. If you knew you were going to die, you'd believe there's a creator God that made you and, to, and, and before whom you will stand one day. The writer of Hebrews says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. 
If you knew you were going to die, you'd stand on the Word of God. You'd believe this book. You wouldn't handle it casually. You'd believe it's the inerrant, inspired Word of God. You'd read it and you'd live by it. Joshua says in 1 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do, to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. We're to chew on it. We're to digest it. We're to do it. We're to have our worldview determined by it. When you begin to stand on the Word of God, there are things you will believe that will define the direction and the values of your life that are Christ-centered and not self-centered. Christ-centered and not culture-centered. Christ-centered that will give you center. That will give you direction. I don't understand all the Bible, but I believe it. I don't understand my wife, but I love her. (laughs) (laughs) Mercy me. Hello. If you ever figure out women, men, let me know, Adam. Your wife gone? She's upstairs or somewhere? You got a good one. My wife says, I'm remedial. (laughs) I need trained over and over again. But you know, I love her. Give my life for her. I love this book, don't you? I love the one who wrote the book. Jesus Christ. If you knew you were going to die, you'd get your faith right. If you knew you was going to die, you'd be a person of conviction. If you knew you was going to die, you'd stand on the word of God. If you knew you was going to die, you'd get connected to a church. Now, I'm not... I'm, I'm not aware of what I'm talking about, but, but your pastor is. There's some of you that have been perpetual visitors at Union 3 Baptist Church. You've been coming here a long time. It's time for you tonight to get connected to this church. Amen? Come on. It, it is. It's time for you to come and take his pastor's hand and say, I want this to be my home. I want this to be my family. This is where I want to put my roots down. I want to serve here. I want to be known here as a person that's faithful. There's some of you who have professed Jesus, but you've never confessed Jesus in baptism. Boy, it gets quiet right there. You've professed him with your mouth. But you have not confessed him in your heart by following in in, in believers' baptism. It's the first step of obedience. If he died on a cross for you, surely, 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 you can take a public stand for him. It's a night to do it. We know the people that are connected to a church, they grow more quickly, they serve. Not just in worship, but they're in a Bible study class. And what so excites me about what's going on in this church is your pastor's emphasis and your staff's emphasis on making disciples and getting people in groups and getting people involved in ministry and getting people share their faith. I appreciate Brother Joey's conviction that if you don't know how to share your faith and if you aren't sharing your faith, you can't be a leader here. In fact, you're not a leader. (laughs) It's not that you can't be one. You ain't one. The people that know Jesus, they're like Peter and John. Whether it's right before God, you decide, but we can't keep our mouth shut. (laughs) We can't help but tell people about Jesus. (laughs) If you knew you were going to die, you'd get your faith right, you'd be a person of conviction, you'd stand on the Word of God, and you'd get connected to a church family, and then... You'd make your family a priority. You see, what happened to me in in the late 80s was the church became my mistress. I never had an affair, been faithful to my wife, but the church became my mistress. 
Life got all out of balance. I was on vacation in San Augustine, Florida. My daughter was, she was about six years old. I missed, I missed about four years of her life. I was working on a doctorate. I was building buildings. I had no staff. It's me. Church is blowing. I was involved in the convention. I was involved in the association. I was going here. I was going there. And in June of 1986, God put me down. I thought I was having a heart attack. Took me to the my, my, took me to emergency room. They checked my heart out. Said, Mr. Garland, nothing wrong with your heart. He said, do you have any stress in your life? I said, well, I'm a Baptist pastor. And he said, well, that's probably enough. He was from Kentucky, Owensboro, actually. He looked at me and he said, what you've had is an anxiety attack. But what God taught me that morning when I thought I was di- going to die of a heart attack, he, t- he showed me that my whole life was out of kilter. That the church, that I had become an idolater. The church had become my mistress. He said, I want you to go back and I want you, I hear, here, here was the order. God first, family second, church third. You hearing me? You boys hearing me? Hmm? Where's that other one? There he is. There he is. Y'all hearing me? Hmm? You hearing me? Barry, you listening to me? You all need to hold them accountable. God first. Family second. I'm so tired of hearing about pastors that have morally fallen. And almost without exception, it's because they've committed idolatry. Not just adultery. If you knew you was going to die, you'd get your faith right. You'd become a person of conviction. You'd stand on the Word of God. You'd get connected to a church family, and you'd get your family in the right order. That's why I'm driving home tonight. I want to go see Mama. I'm taking my grandkids next week to Disney. They'll have a big time. I'll be exhausted, but I'll have a good time. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I'm <laughs> at 67. I'm not sure Disney's the place I want to go, but I'm going. Why? Because my family is a priority. You, you, are, are, are you with me? And then the final thing. If you knew you was going to die, you'd draw a line. Here's what, you, here, here's what you would say. Stay away from or quit. And you finish the sentence. I don't drink alcohol. I don't understand why anybody does. I know of no good that's ever come from it. None. You can't show me any good. Now, some of you drink. But I'm telling you, there's no good that comes out of it. It won't send you to hell. It'll just make you feel like you've been there. Hello. I'm, I'm talking out of personal experience here. That's my line. I also know I'm a, I'm a workaholic. I have an addictive personality. So part of my line is I have to be careful. I don't work all the time. So that's part of why I got in trouble when God said to me, the church has become your mistress. You're a workaholic. You're not spending time. You're not discipling your own daughter. You're not spending time with your wife. You don't have a date not with your wife every week. What's your line? What's your line? See, if you knew you was going to die, you'd get all that stuff cleaned up. I read this as a true story, Barry. It's a good story. <laughs> y'all been to Haiti? Joey, y'all been to Haiti? Anybody here been to Haiti? I, been to Haiti? Stories told about a, a man in Haiti that... Uh, um, was trying to sell his house. And uh, he, he tried to sell his house for $2,000. And uh, 
But another man came and said, well, I don't have $2,000, but I'll, I'll give you $1,000. And the owner agreed to sell him the house, but the stipulation went that the man selling the house for $1,000 instead of $2,000, he'd sell him the house for $1,000, except he would own the nail that was over the top of the door. And the guy that bought it, he said, oh, that's fine. You can own the nail. So a few years later, the original owner decided he wanted to buy the house back. And understandably, the new owner did not want to sell. So the original owner found the carcass of a dead dog in the street and hung it on the nail that he still owned. And he made the house inhabitable. What does that story mean? If you give the devil one nail in your life, he will hang his dead carcass on it and destroy you. So what's your nail tonight? This is Celebrate Recovery. 42 years, 8 months, and 12 days. (laughs) Ain't nothing like it. But I'm telling you, I remember it every day. I don't want God to have one nail, not one fiber of me. I don't want him to have any of you. So tonight, the invitation is pretty simple. If you need to get your faith right, come on. Right, Brother Joy? If you need to get your church membership right, come on. Some of them, your baptism isn't right. You were baptized and then saved. Or you were saved and you've never been baptized. Some of you just got a little bit of water. We want to put you all the way under. Get Adam to hold you under until you bubble. (laughs) You ain't done that yet, but you've thought about it a couple times, haven't you? We want you to get a conviction about the Word of God. You won't make it without the Word. We want you to get a conviction about what your temptation is and draw a line and ask God to give you the power and the strength every day, sometimes every hour. Stay by. And you know what, Jessica? He will, won't he? Randy, he will, won't he? Amen. Let's stay. Hey, guys, I'm the pastor of Union 3. My name is Joey Hanner, and uh, we are so thankful that you've been able to listen to the message today. But I want you to know that God has a plan for your life. And today, when we think about salvation, uh, I was one of those church members, one of those people that said I prayed when I was younger, and uh, but my life did not change. When, we, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, your life will change. God has a plan for your life. You see, He created you for heaven, but you can't earn or deserve that because heaven is a perfect place. And God says, I'm not going to let one sin into heaven. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we think about sin, we think about murder, we think about stealing. But the sin is what we think is, is our thought life. And we are just sinful by nature. And But Jesus came where it doesn't have to be that way. God loves us. He said, I'll solve that problem. I'm going to send my son Jesus. He sent his son for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? everlasting life you see God came to give you life and he wants us to be more than a church member he wants us to be more than someone that prayed a prayer said a decision praying a prayer is the greatest power there is because that is our tool and the instrument God give us to repent he said if you'll repent he said times of refreshing will come in your life you see in our life God looks at us but he can't see, he can see us. We can't have a relationship with him because this sin separates us from God. But we take and we have intellectual, we know that God exists. We have intellectual faith. But we just believe that he's there. But we don't really have a relationship with him. Uh, we have temporal faith. Temporal faith is, well, God, I tell you what, if you'll fix this in my life, I'll turn my life around. Well, where does my sin go? It doesn't go anywhere. Well, God, I tell you what, if you'll do this in my life, I promise you I'll turn over a new leaf. It'll go for a little while, and it'll just, we'll go right back into the same old, same old. Why? Because we think we can change ourselves. Friend, you can't change yourself. 
If you could, you would have already done it. Only thing that can change your life is by God's grace. He came into this world so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. That's why the scripture says, all like sheep have gone astray, each into his own way. But God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, he takes his sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. And there's one mediator. His name is Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches that. It also teaches in first or in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. So can you go to a time in your life that you trusted Jesus? If you never have, you can do it by just saying, Jesus, I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and be my Savior. I am trusting you today to save me. And you will be my Lord and be my Savior. If you've done that today, we're proud of you. And we'd love to hear from you here at Union 3. Go to u3bchurch.com or just call the church office and let someone know, 256-494-9180. We would love to hear from you. And thank you again for watching here at Union 3 Baptist Church. We love you, and we have a great big old life.